The problem of public key crypto is to solve the issue of the person has your message and the person has the complete algorithm used to encrypt that message. Is the inverse hard to find? And the hope is we can at least make it difficult in a particular way. And so what we use is RSA. Personally, I don't like that anymore. I like to call it Cox. He did it first just because he had to keep his name secret and not tell anybody about it doesn't mean he didn't do it first. All right, how does this work? Step one. P and Q are large primes. Note, these are the true private key. You cannot tell anyone about these. These are the things you lock up. From these two large primes, we're going to do the following things. Two, the number n is equal to p times q. The number m is equal to p minus 1 times q minus 1. Do not tell anybody about m, <laughs> right? Because that would, m and n would start to help them figure out what p and q were, right? So this is also something that you don't tell anybody about. Three, pick a number we're going to call E so that the GCD of E and M are one. They're relatively prime. The purpose of this is I want to find E's inverse. Four. Find D, which is E's inverse, mod M. It exists because the relatively prime part, right? I would have to use Euclid's algorithm, right? It's like E and M are relatively prime, right? That means I could use Euclid's algorithm, throw it in reverse, and I could find D. Then what we do with this is what you make public is you're going to hand out E and you're going to hand out N. What you're going to keep private is D, P, Q, and M. Obviously, you really don't need to. You could actually go ahead and just delete M. Its purpose was, its sole purpose was to create D. This here is called the, the public key. The other is private. You don't tell anybody. But E and D are inverses of one another. And so then what do we do? OK. F of plain text is we're going to take this plain text, raise it to the E power, and then take mod N. To decrypt it, the inverse function, and I apply to C, is C to the D power mod N. All right, why does this work? Well, if C, which is F of P, right? That's actually C. So C is acting like P to the E. Then what would be C to the D? It would be P to the E to the D. And what's E times D? They are inverses. So they spit out 1 mod M. So it actually is 1 plus a multiple of M. But it ends up being that if you have this 1 plus a multiple of M in the power, if you read the previous two sections where we have Chinese remainder theorem, solving congruences, what ends up being that if you're off of M, you know, it's two primes. You're out by those prime factors by one, and you put those up in the power. Essentially, they just doesn't matter. You get one. It ends up that E and D is going to be one when we take our mod N, and so it just simply knocks out the E. So you say, oh, I took my number, raised it to a power. Well, if I raise it to the inverse, I just simply multiply it by one. I'm going to get the number back. 
So this is your encryption function. Obviously, E and N are necessary to encrypt. So how does Cox cryptography work? What you do is a person online says, I want to communicate with you securely. Here's the number E, here's the number N. Take your message, break it into blocks, take a number to the E power mod N, send me that number. Take the next number to the E power mod N, send me that number. And then what do I do? I take those numbers, raise them to the D power mod N, and it goes back to the plain text. Now, what was the way that you found D? To find D, you had to know M, but to know M, you need to know P and Q. Here's my problem, though. Did I actually give them P and Q? They're mixed by multiplication. So my hope is they cannot factor. If they can factor, I'm toast. All of cryptography is based upon this. I hope you can't factor. Well, factoring is provably hard, so where do people attack this? You don't pick a large enough prime. Factoring is too easy. I'm supposed to pick large primes. Well, how do you pick large primes? Well, say it's large. Well, how, do you, how did you select it? Well, I picked a prime and the prime right beside it. That's a pretty bad idea, right? <laughs> And so I need to have randomly selected primes. What's random? Sure, I have lots and lots and lots of primes. We have the prime number theorem, like on where, where they occur and how often they have a lot of primes to pick from. What if your randomness is, oh yeah, you, were, you had several quadrillion to pick from, but your algorithm that you used for randomly picking primes was really only about 1,000. You have a really bad random <laughs> choice. And it's like, oh, you attack the person on their randomness. And that's a common technique. If you can modify the hardware or pay attention to the hardware, or their random algorithm is a very weak algorithm, they don't have all primes to pick from but a subset. And then you just try those, and then you can break their code again. So most of it is, most of this breaking of this sort of cryptography is in this issue. Pick your primes. And they just are bad at it. They might not know it. They don't even know that they just simply use a, use a function that says rand. Is that a good function? I mean, how much of you guys, when you've programmed, have you used the random function? Is it a good function? Do you know if it's a good function? Here's an easy example if you do any programming in MATLAB. Go into MATLAB and have it spit out, just start it, have it pick five random numbers, close MATLAB, relaunch MATLAB, and say pick five random numbers. It will spit out the exact same five. Always. So if you didn't know that, were you, oh, I'm supposed to seed my function before I start to pick random things. Right? If you know the person doesn't, they, you look at their code, you break it and say, wait a second, they're not using random very well. Ha ha, I win. And you break all their cryptography. You have to, this is a good example of what I mentioned that you know previously, don't do things that, use things that you don't know exactly what they're doing. If you call RAND and it was important, you better know what that function just did. Well, what did you do, what did it do? It paid attention to, it collected entropy. It listened to network packet, packets and electronic sparks on the face of the sun, and then, then generated a random. It's like, in other words, it tries to get physical randomness before it actually creates a random stream. Those are huge amounts of research that you have to worry about. All right, but doing it, it's not hard, right? Just take two, so I could take this entire problem and say, normally when we actually to do Cox Crypto, RSA, how do we do it? It's all right. Uh, what do you want to pick? Pick a non-large prime. Just give me a prime. Seven. And then Q. Give me another non-large prime. Thirteen. Okay, what's N now? 
What's 7 times 13? 91. What's M? 6 times 12, which is 72. Alright, so that's my N and M. Okay, now I need to get an E so that the GCD of E and M is 1. The easiest way to do this, M is obviously going to be divisible by 4, right? It's going to be an even. Why? Because if P and Q are primes, the numbers in front of the primes are even numbers. I'll have to and you pick something that does not divide 72. Well, 72 is 6 and 12, which was 3 times 4, which is, there's actually, what, 6 times 2, so it's actually 6 squared, so there's 2s and 3s in it, right? So I ought to pick, just pick a prime that is not one of the prime factors of 72. 5. So I'm just going to go ahead. We're going to let E equal 5. And you usually want to pick small ones because you're going to be doing this work, right? All right, so that's true. Then we're going to do it. Okay, what is a GCD? Now the question is D is E's inverse. How do I find that with the GCD of 72 and 5? Well, 72, I know what the answer is. It's 1, but that's not the point. 72 is how many 5s? We have 14 5s, and then what left over? 2. And then 5 is how many 2s with what left over? One. So let's go ahead and stop. There's my GCD. So one, my GCD is equal to a five minus a plus a negative two two. Is everybody okay with that? But then what's two? <coughs> what would I replace two by? A Seventy-two and negative fourteen fives. Everybody okay with that? So 1 is, how many 5s do you see? I have 29 5s and then negative 2 72s. So what is 5's inverse? It's 29 under mod 72. Is everybody okay with that? What would happen if I would have found a negative number? What should I do? Add I should add 72, right? Okay, but in the end, that's 29. So how do you encrypt? I take a plain text and do what? P to the E mod, what was N? N was 91. F inverse of C, I would take C to the what power? 29 and mod 91. And that's how I encrypt and decrypt. Big time out. Mod 91 spits out how many numbers? 91. What is the greatest number of symbols that I can encode? Everybody say 91. Because <laughs> it has to be one to one and on to, right? If the biggest is function will spit out a 0 to 90, I can't have any more symbols than that. That automatically says the symbols that I use must be less than or equal to 91. Is everybody okay with that? So I can have at most 91 symbols. Now, if I take bigger primes, that number does what? <coughs> Gets bigger, right? The question is, well, how big do you want to get? Well... <coughs> So one of the questions we have on use, to use this, note, because this is mod 91, we can have at most 91 symbols. Everybody okay with that? Um, let me see here. Do, 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 do. So, oops, make this big. I'll 
spreadsheet. Oh, I didn't want a graphical octave. Ah, oh well. Primes 100. Let's say 150. All right, so that's prime. So if I said P, let's say I take 131 and then times uh, 149, and that's my N, right? So let's say my N was uh, 19,519. So how many symbols can I have? 19,519. One of the things that we can do to make our problem smarter than character character replacement is to do a block replacement. And since this is the largest number of symbols that I can do, what I could do is I'm, I'm replacing numbers, right? So if I had a large enough version, what we normally do is if we had mod n is big, say example, what did I just have, 19,000? I took mod 19519, right? Then what I could do is things like this. If I did mark, what I could do is not do M and A, M separate from A, I could block it. And then say A is like 0, 0. And M is, which one's M? A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, I, J, K. 12, I think. So 12, 0, 0. And so then what we do is we don't do one symbol at a time, we do blocks of symbols. And so the bigger it is, the bigger the block we can do. And the bigger the block you do, what you're actually doing is adding an extra level of mixing. Because MA is essentially a mix. I'm not doing a single symbol, I'm doing block symbols. And so we do a mix into the numbers, we take that number, take it to the E power mod N, that's another block of numbers, and then I start shipping those blocks. And so that's what we do for RSA cryptography. One of the, in real examples, you block it. The question is how big of blocks do we want to agree upon? Well, we have to agree upon things within the size of n. But when we pick really, really large primes, you're free <laughs> to do whatever you want. Because n is huge, which means we're going to have to have special algorithms.